Baptist Mission Board, and we'd be in prayer for the deacon nominations. Uh, coming up in October, and then we're going to have the community prayer walk October 10th at 5 o'clock. Is there anything else? Well, you know, you know, Let's pray. Uh, Father, we just praise you for being, being able to be here, worship you on this beautiful morning. It's just a great day to be at church, Lord. We ask you to forgive us our many sins and commission, commission. We just ask you to be with us to help us with our people. Lord, and if there's been any sick, if there's been any clear evidence, just please bless us throughout the day. Christ's name we pray. if you will stand with me.
morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you all for being here with us um, this morning. I'll be handling the prayer of praise, so if you'll bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and our opportunity to be here. And like the song says, we are here to serve you with gladness, Father. And so not only today as we come together and we worship corporately as a body and we fellowship with one another, but maybe also take that same attitude with us as we go outside of the walls of this church and uh, take it with us to work, to school, to wherever you guide us, Father. To all of those that we cross paths with, may we share your love, your mercy, and your grace with each and every person. We love you, Father. We praise you. We bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Max. Well, good morning. good morning. It is good to see each of you here today. Today, we've got a special guest with us, and it's Kyle Scott. He's going to come. He's going to bring a message, and he's also going to tell us about mission dignity. I became familiar with that a couple of years ago. One of our members really became burdened uh, for mission dignity. And she spoke to the missions committee. And uh, at any rate, we now have a speaker coming to tell us about it. We've already given one gift and we're giving another gift to mission dignity. Mission dignity, and he's gonna tell you about it. But just what caught my attention is the fact that there are many, many pastors and their widows that serve faithfully, especially in small churches. And I mean these smaller than our church. And they struggle in their retirement years. And so mission dignity is something that comes along and those that qualify is able to give them a few extra dollars a month, which means a lot. So Scott, or Scott, you shouldn't have two, you know, first names. Kyle Scott. Kyle, uh, he told me that uh, his wife Hannah and uh, Eli and Jonah, that's his children, all of those are good biblical names, by the way. That's the joy of his life. And he's currently uh, a student at Southwestern. He's getting his PhD. But at the same time, he's working with Mission Dignity. So we're looking forward to hearing from you and we just wanted, to, just wanted to let you know we appreciate you so much, Kevin. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Father, as we come to you today, we, we rejoice. What a beautiful day that you have made. And Father, I thank you for each person that set aside anything else they could have done and have come to the, your house. I thank you for those that have already been in the, our Sunday school classes. And now I thank you for those assembled here to listen to the singing, to participate in the, the giving that we are, are making available, to hear the word of God. Father, all of this is worship. I just thank you for being able to do that. Father, I also would like to bring to your attention those in our midst that are not doing well. We know there are many. Father, I ask that you be with them. I ask that you be with them in a special way. I ask that you give them, first of all, peace. I ask that if it is your will, I'm asking for a healing hand to be laid upon them. But above all, Father, I'm asking that each of us would just reach out to, to everyone, but especially to our own members, and let them know how much they mean to the family of God. Now, Father, be with us in this service. May it all glorify your name. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. next hymn uh, is hymn number 514, When We All Get to Heaven. If you'll stand with me, we're singing about heaven. Stand up with me. Join me, please, and let's have some smiles on our faces. <laughs>
Guidestone has been on a mission to provide dignity to retirement age Southern Baptist ministers, workers, and widows in need. It was the heart of our founder, William Lunsford, as he observed veteran pastors and their widows in poverty to provide for these soldiers of the cross in their declining years. Give yourself wholeheartedly to the work. We'll stand back of it. If you fall in the work, we'll care for you. If you die, we will not allow your family to suffer. If you grow old in the work, we'll comfort you in your declining years. Throughout the past century, donations from people like you and churches like yours have met the needs of Mission Dignity recipients. These heroes of the faith have served steadfastly during their ministry years, shepherding churches, caring for others, and sharing the gospel. And I always wanted to have that as an epitaph for my tombstone, passing through and preach the word. From one generation to the next, Mission Dignity has served devoted pastors who were paid very little and were barely able to afford their monthly bills. And I have went to bed hungry because I want my bills paid. I've got to pay for my meds. In recent decades, many pastors served and still serve churches at the crossroads of small towns, inner cities, and remote places receiving very little income. I didn't have a mega church, but I had a mega heart. Additionally, this past year has been especially difficult for recipients who found themselves sheltering in place in the pandemic. Isolated, lonely, and afraid to get out among people, even to go to church. As it is written in 1 Timothy, these laborers are worthy of double honor. The wonderful thing about giving to Mission Dignity is that 100% of your donations go to the recipient. The Lord uses it in a great and mighty way. Your gifts make a tremendous difference in the lives of God's choicest servants, and Mission Dignity serves them by providing financial support, sending care packages, making wellness calls, and meeting emergency needs such as medical, dental, and home repairs. I want to thank all of you who are helping us, mission dignity is essential for our survival in a better way. God bless you and God bless the ministry of the mission dignity. Give honor, give dignity, give today. Text MD Sunday to 41444 or visit missiondignity.org. so much for allowing me to come to speak to you about our ministry at Guidestone called Mission Dignity. I feel like that video gives you a better picture than I could ever give you. Uh, but we've been around about a hundred years, uh, and the fact that uh, people still haven't heard of us, that's not new to us. Actually, before I started working for Mission Dignity about two years ago, I didn't know that Mission Dignity existed. Uh, but when I heard about the mission that we uh, assist retirement age Southern Baptist pastors, denominational workers, and their widows through financial assistance and advocacy for those who are struggling to meet or to make ends meet. I had to be a part of this ministry and I am so grateful that you as a church want to be involved with this ministry because it's really like that video said, it's only because of churches like yours, like Damascus Baptist Church, that we're able to fulfill our mission to serve these pastors and their widows and give them double honor for the, the work that they've done for the Lord and for his church. So thank you uh, for allowing me to be here. Thank you for letting me speak to you this morning. Uh, I am going to be speaking out of Philemon. Uh, it is the letter right after the book of Titus, uh, one of Paul's uh, most intimate letters. But while you guys turn there, uh, they, we all have major moments in our lives that change everything. Uh, and Pastor Stockton, he mentioned that I have a wife and two kids. And those moments where I married my wife and where uh, my children were born, those are the two moments that really stick out to me. There are a ton of other moments, but those are the ones that I, I look back on and think, my life has forever changed because of those moments. Uh, 
Uh, I can still, to this day, picture my wife walking down the aisle to come meet me on stage where we said our vows together. And in that moment where I was saying our vows, I knew nothing would ever be the same. It wasn't only about me anymore. It was every decision I made, every action I did had a direct impact on her. Uh, and so I began to think in a different way. I began to act in a different way because I knew that it was different now. Uh, and the same for when my kids were born. I can still picture myself in the hospital. I can still hear uh, my daughter and son cry for the first time. And normally that would irritate me and it would you know, be a, a scratching on my ears. But those moments, uh, I remember thinking that that is one of the best sounds in the world that I've ever heard. Uh, and it, in the same way, I knew that my life would never be the same. It was never uh, just about me anymore. It was never just about my wife and I. Every action that I did, every word that I said would be picked up by them uh, and they would take it and run with it. And so my actions changed, my heart changed. Uh, all of that changed when I got married and when I had kids. And in the book of Philemon, we see Paul reminding a person what major change happens when we believe in Christ. And so we'll, we'll read it here quickly and then we'll jump in. Uh, so Philemon verses 1 through 7 reads this. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Athia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. Now let's pray. Father, I pray that you would speak this morning, that your Holy Spirit uh, would make this text come alive, and that your word would go out and not return void. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you for your word, and we pray that you would speak this morning. It's in your son's name. I ask these things by the power of your spirit. Amen. Now Philemon is different than most of Paul's letters. This is a very intimate letter written to a very specific individual about a very specific uh, situation. Uh, and the context around this letter, Philemon, he owned a slave named Onesimus. Uh, and he had run away from Philemon. And while on the run, Onesimus met Paul, potentially in prison where Paul was chained. Now, history doesn't tell us where they met or when they met exactly, but when they met, Paul did what he does best. He led only Simon's to Christ. That's the heartbeat of Paul. Every person he interacted with heard about Christ, and only Simon was one of those. And he came to know Christ in a drastically new way. Only Simon is now a new man, changed by his faith in Christ. But there was a problem. Paul and only Simon both knew that only Simon was a runaway slave, and they both also knew the Roman law which meant uh, that Onesimus had to return to Philemon as his slave, and he had to repay Philemon uh, for what he had done for him. Now, uh, Philemon, it, we're, we're not really sure what Onesimus did when he left. It could have been that he just owed Philemon for the work that he had missed while he was away. Uh, but there's also the, the possibility that Onesimus actually stole something from Philemon when he left. And so it might not just be the thing, or the time that he had to repay, but also, a very tangible material thing that, that only Simon's had to repay to Philemon. Uh, now, regardless of what the, the issue was, only Simon's had to return to Philemon and he had to repay him. And that's where Paul steps in. Paul and only Simon's both knew that Philemon had every right to punish him based on the Roman law. Uh, Paul, though, recognized a monumental shift that occurred when someone came to know Christ. You know, relationships change. Christ makes all things new. And so Paul, as he's in chains, is asking someone to write this letter uh, to his fellow co-worker, his brother, Philemon. Uh, now, in reality, uh, Paul was calling Philemon to his higher calling in Christ. And it's in the first seven verses we get a summary of what that higher calling is for all of us, not just for Philemon. Paul is speaking in broad terms here. And if, if I could put it in one main idea, it's that the root of faith in Christ grows the good fruit of the Christian life. This is the whole point that Paul is getting at in these first seven verses. Uh, and so in verses one through three, we see the root of faith in Christ grows due relationships to others. 
So reading that again, it says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the only letter, just in looking at all of Paul's letters, this is the only letter where Paul actually calls himself a prisoner. Most of the time it's an apostle of Jesus Christ or a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this is the only time he calls himself a prisoner. Now, it's probably because he had such a personal relationship with Philemon that he calls himself a prisoner instead of an apostle or servant of Jesus Christ. That would be like looking at my wife and saying, Hi, I'm Mr. Scott. I would like for you to call me that from now on. It, it, it would be ridiculous to say that to someone you knew so well. Uh, but there's also uh, something different about this. Uh, and he actually clarifies that a little bit more in verses 2 and 3. So he calls Philemon, a fellow worker and a friend, uh, Aphia, his and Timothy's beloved sister. And if you look in, in the Greek, it actually says beloved sister, not just the beloved Aphia. It, it's a familial relationship that he has with Aphia now. And they, they mention Archippus, their fellow soldier. And they also mention the church in Philemon's house. So Aphia and Archippus are often thought to be Philemon's wife and son. And this reference to a church that meets in Philemon's home helps fill out who exactly this Philemon is. So we've got Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, writing to this very specific man named Philemon. And apparently his wife and son and the church that meets in his house. Now, in the New Testament world, most people lived in rooms rather than full houses, and only the wealthy had houses large enough to host gatherings. So what Paul is telling us here is that Philemon was actually a pretty wealthy guy. He was the sponsor, if you will, of the church that met in his home. He was able to, to bring people in because he had so much wealth and had his house, and he hosted the church. Now, given Paul's status as a prisoner, there's no reason that he and Philemon should know each other as well as Paul leads us to believe they do. They wouldn't have run in the same crowds. Paul is in prison. There's no reason why Philemon would also be in the same circles as Paul. Uh, they wouldn't have had much in common besides their Roman citizenship, and even that wouldn't have mattered much. The Roman Empire was so spread out and so uh, diverse that Paul, a Jewish man, probably didn't have much in common with Philemon, who is a Greek man. Now, there would be no real draw for them to be as close as Paul leads us to believe they are, like I mentioned. But things change when we come to know Christ through faith. In Christ, Paul and Philemon are now way more than just citizens of Rome together. They're citizens of a heavenly kingdom together. They're equals. Uh, they're, they're not just a prisoner and a wealthy man separated by socioeconomic class. They are equals. They're brothers together through faith with God as their Father and Christ as their Savior. And they go from having nothing in common as prisoner and wealthy man to having everything in common in Christ together. And one illustration, you know, I mentioned that I work for Mission Dignity. That's the whole reason I'm here. And we serve the best people in the world. Uh, and there's a, there's a lady by the name of Miss Dolly Holton. She used to live in Florida. Her and her husband did lots of ministry down in Florida, but she moved out to California recently. And a couple of years ago, we were able to help her uh, afford some eye surgery that she was desperately needing. She couldn't see very well, and she wrote to us about it, and we were able to, to provide the funding to actually help her see again. Uh, and after that, she wrote us a letter uh, where she told us, I'm, I'm writing you a letter, and I can actually see what I'm writing again. Uh, and in that letter, she said, I am so thankful for my family in Texas. Now, we've never met Miss Dolly Holton in person. Honestly, we're, we're separated by so much land, whether it's in Florida or California. Texas is right in the middle, and it takes three days to get out of Texas, I can tell you from personal experience. Uh, and so to drive from Texas to Florida or from Texas to California, it's a long trip. And so we've never met Miss Dolly Holton, but the fact that we are brothers and sisters together in Christ, she was able to recognize we have a bond that extends way beyond uh, what a normal family would be. So we have a bond in Christ. And one day when we all get to heaven, we'll be able to look Miss Dolly in the, in the face and she can tell us thank you and we can tell her thank you right back. Because she said in that letter, she's praying for us. She is, is excited about our ministry and she uh, just loves us. Uh, and so we have a family beyond what we would normally consider family. And we, we have that family 
because of our faith in Christ. And so the root of faith in Christ gives us a new family in Christ. Uh, and where we were once alienated from one another for many different reasons, whether it's because we were separated geographically or we didn't run in the same circles, now in Christ we're united together uh, as one family for eternity. And so moving on to verses 4 through 6, we also see that the root of faith in Christ grows a loving disposition of our hearts and loving actions towards another. And those two things are totally inseparable. Uh, they, they have to go together. And so reading verses 4 through 6 again, Paul writes, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. Now, much of what Paul thanks God for in verses 4 through 6 actually reveals how much he thinks of Philemon. <clears throat> now, one commentator goes so far as to say that Paul's comments here mark Philemon in the, the letters of Paul as an exemplary Christian. Can you imagine being called an exemplary Christian by the Apostle Paul? That would be like Herschel Walker watching you play football and saying, man, you're an exemplary football player. It, it, there's just no higher compliment you can get. But what makes Philemon an exemplary Christian in the eyes of Paul? I'm here to tell you, it's actually really simple. Uh, he mentions two things that Philemon has. Faith in Christ and love towards the saints. Those are the only two things that he mentions Philemon having that make him an exemplary Christian. So these are the two things we're going to talk about. Faith in Christ first here means a radical belief in Christ's perfect life, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead is sufficient for the forgiveness of our sins and the promise of eternal life with him. And we don't have much information on life or on Philemon's life or his conversion, uh, but his faith in Christ is clearly a defining feature of his life. Uh, when Paul talks about Philemon, he says he hears about Philemon's faith. Not that he heard, not that, oh, someone told me about it a long time ago, but that he hears about it. It's something that is still ongoing in Philemon's life. It's something that defines his everyday interaction with people. So this is a very real thing that Philemon lives out. Uh, others noticed and worked out back to Paul that Philemon was living in a way that testified to his faith in Christ. And it's the second part of Paul's encouragement that tells us what made Philemon's faith so evident. And it's his love for the saints. Now, we hear a lot about love in our society. Uh, we hear a lot about it during the Christmas season specifically. Uh, and we've gotten a heavy dose of what our culture thinks of as love in the form of Hallmark movies. Uh, now, my wife and I love to watch those because they are absolutely ridiculous. And so we get a good laugh out of them. But, you know, the plot typically goes something like this. Uh, the main character has a really demanding job in a big city, uh, and they get put on a special assignment to go home to their really rural town, uh, and they get back home uh, to, to do whatever the job is they've been assigned to do, and inexplicably, their high school sweetheart is still single. He just never got over the main character. She never got over him, uh, and they have a few awkward encounters throughout the movie, and eventually they realize, oh, we're meant to be together, and so he or she abandons her job in the big city, and they move back home and they get married and everything's fine. Now, these movies are funny because they're so ridiculous on a lot of different levels, but it, it, it's this picture of the main character being the only person for whom this story is written. It's never really about anyone else. It's only about the main character. The questions that are asked are only ever, how can this make me happy? What do I have to get from it? Uh, and that almost verbatim, in the movies, they're always asked, what do you want? This is a very self-serving picture of love. Uh, everything in the movie revolves around the wants of the main character and what will make them happy. And being happy isn't a bad thing, but it's this type of love that's self-serving isn't the biblical understanding of love. And what Paul is getting at here is much deeper than the love we see in these movies. Uh, it's modeled after Christ himself. It has two major components. And we can turn to 1 John 3, 16 through 17 to see the first one, which it's a self-sacrificing love rather than a self-serving love. And 
In 1 John 3, 16 through 17, John writes, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And he doesn't leave it there. He actually gets very specific in how we are to live out our faith in a self-sacrificial way. And in verse 17, he says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? When Paul spoke about love, this is what he had in mind, the self-sacrificing love that, that gives everything to serve our brothers and sisters. Muriel Evans is one of the recipients we serve. She lives over in Florida as well, uh, but that's not where she's from. She's actually from North Carolina, and many years ago she was called to be a missionary in Eastern Europe. Uh, and she spent many years there, uh, honestly during the height of the Soviet Union. Uh, so when Christianity was outlawed in that country, she was over there serving the people of God. Uh, two of the things that she did, uh, she provided respite care for pastors who were in these areas uh, that were persecuted. She would smuggle them out, essentially, uh, and provide care for them, help them get refreshed, help them get restored physically, spiritually, and then they would go back in uh, because they had such a love for the people of God and such a, a desire to see more people come to know Christ in that country. The other thing that she did was she was actually a professional Bible smuggler. So she would load trucks up with Bibles and send them into the Soviet Union so that more people might come to know Christ, more people might come to faith in Christ, so that she might have a bigger family in Christ because of her work. And now, she's not in Eastern Europe anymore, but she's still serving her community. She is still actually opening up her home to others who need a place to stay. So she is self-sacrificing in a very real way. She has the world's goods, and she sees her brothers and sisters in and she's opening up her home to give them a place to stay and get back on their feet. Uh, and so Muriel Evans, uh, like I said, one of our recipients, she's a great example of what this self-sacrificing love looks like, not only in her current uh, situation, but also in her past, where she was a missionary. Uh, the other aspect of Christian love is identification with her family. You know, the Apostle John talks about serving the needs of our brethren, our brothers and sisters. And Paul points to this aspect of love when he talks about the sharing of your faith. Now on the surface, it looks like Paul is talking about evangelism here. Now Paul, as we talked about, he is very passionate about evangelism. But this isn't the idea that he has in mind here. He is connecting this idea of sharing the faith uh, with his love, with the love for the saints. And what he's speaking about here is a true, deep fellowship with Philemon's new family. He's reminding him that you have this identification with your family that's unlike anything you should know outside of the family of Christ. And one commentator uh, says this in, in terms of what Paul is talking about. He says, Christians not only belong to one another, but actually become mutually identified, truly rejoicing with the happy and genuinely weeping with the sad. So let's think of it another way. Paul often talks about the church being the body of Christ. Have you ever hurt your pinky toe? Have you ever smashed your finger with a hammer? Uh, the, the smallest part of you uh, that gets hurt actually affects the rest of your body. A couple of weeks ago, I busted a blood vessel in my index finger, and it was the most frustrating thing. I had to cut fruit differently. I couldn't open doors the right way. It was ridiculous. And that little joint caused the rest of my body pain because the muscles that weren't used to to working in certain ways had to compensate for this. And so I, you know, my left shoulder was sore, uh, was sore because I was opening doors and doing all the things that I normally do with my right hand and right arm. And in a sense, that, that, that's kind of what Paul is getting at here. When one part of us hurts, the whole body hurts. And when the whole body is healthy, the, whether you realize or not, your body is rejoicing. Uh, and I certainly rejoice after, now after having gone through that. And when my whole body is healthy, I rejoice. Uh, so that's what Paul's getting at here. Uh, that's the mutual identification Paul is talking about here. He knows that the Christian faith, which creates this new family that we all belong to, creates a bond that surpasses all understanding between us as brothers and sisters in Christ. We weep 
with those in our family who are struggling, who are suffering. And we rejoice with our family when good things happen. And we do those things because they are our family. And our hearts are intertwined together with Christ. Now, directly tied to Philemon sharing his faith, uh, this, this deep-rooted fellowship is this idea that's become active or effective. Uh, I'm not going to lie, this, this verse gave me some trouble, verse 6 did. So I was like, I don't know what that means. But what Paul is getting at here, he's, it, it's really simple. Christian faith is not meant to be kept a secret. It demands to be lived out. It changes our hearts, and when our hearts change, our actions change. So this activity of the Christian faith is tied to the knowledge that Paul mentions here. Knowledge in verse 6 is, is a head knowledge and a knowledge gained from experience. So one commentator puts it this way, the Greek word knowledge combines experiential or lived out actions and intellectual meanings, stressing a personal acquaintance with knowledge. Thus, knowing how to apply the faith to the matter at hand comes from experiential knowledge. So what Paul is getting at here is that Philemon, as a believer, should know the right thing to do in all circumstances because he has faith in Christ. Uh, at the core of verse 6, Paul is encouraging Philemon really just to live out his faith. He knows what is right. He knows what the right thing to do in Christ is. And so Paul is saying, live out your faith. Uh, to put it another way, for all of us, when Christians act in accord with the blessings they have in Christ, they grow closer to Christ. And that's the benefit that we have. We, as we do what we know to be right, we actually grow in our faith in Christ and get closer to Christ. And that actually compounds and we do more of what is good and what is right. And so love in the Christian sense uh, entails a, self, a self-sacrificing love that is bound to our new family in Christ. So we seek to self-sacrifice for the good of those around us, and specifically our brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, verse 7, it's sort of separate from this, but it's also directly tied to the first six verses. After telling us about this faith and love that all believers have, Paul actually gives us a glimpse of what this good fruit of a new heart and new actions with a new family means to that family. And he says in verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. And so he rounds this section out with a very simple statement. Philemon's love for the saints has actually impacted him and Timothy. It has given them joy and consolation to hear Philemon's faith and his good works. And as they sit in prison, their chains grow lighter. Their resolve is steeled, and their prison sentence for preaching the gospel is actually made easier to bear because they've been refreshed. They have joy. They have consolation now that the faith of Christ is making a difference outside of that prison cell. And it is moving forward, and the kingdom of God is expanding, and their family is getting bigger. This is the indirect blessing of faith in Christ and the good fruit it produces. But the direct blessing, Paul doesn't leave out either. Philemon has refreshed the hearts of the saints through his Christian, self-sacrificing love for them. And it's not just a good feeling that he's given them. Paul uses the word bowels here, so he's talking about the very deepest part of our emotional being, that they have been refreshed to that deep a level. It's a huge weight that Philemon has lifted off of these saints. And this is the direct result of Philemon's faith in Christ producing the good fruits of the Christian life. And so that's what Paul is reminding him. He's, he's painting this big picture of what faith in Christ does for us. And it really produces the good fruit of the Christian life. Now, why is he doing this for Philemon? It's no accident that he's setting this up. Uh, to then argue the rest of the book, what Philemon should do. Because if you remember, he's writing about a specific circumstance with Onesimus. Onesimus has come to know Christ, and Paul had the foresight to remind Philemon of some key truths of the faith as Onesimus was going to return to Philemon. Onesimus, because of his own faith in Christ, was now his brother, not merely a slave, not merely a hired hand. Their relationship had changed in the time that only Simon and Philemon had last seen one another. And Philemon himself, because of his faith in Christ, had a righteous character, one that produced good fruit, one that taught him 
what to do in specific situations like this. And Paul reminds Philemon that he would know what the right course of action would be to honor a brother in Christ. And ultimately, it meant forgiving Onesimus, identifying with him, weeping with him, rejoicing with him, sacrificing his own rights as a master, and elevating Onesimus beyond his social status and to his spiritual status as a fellow worker and brother in Christ. This was the proper response that Paul was setting up for Philemon to realize. And honestly, much depended on Philemon's response to Paul's letter. On the one hand, if he treated his new Christian brother uh, as a, a renegade or an outlaw, uh, if he treated him with contempt for the wrongs that he committed, his reaction could have brought shame on Christ and his church. It would have looked no different than a normal slave owner. It would have been retribution and repayment. And the, the people, the watching world, uh, would have seen Philemon and said, what makes this Jesus so great? He treats me, or he treats his people the same way that the Romans treat everyone else. Nothing is different about them. Why should I follow their Jesus? On the other hand, if Philemon forgave Onesimus and welcomed him as a brother, a watching world would witness a family of believers living out the grace and love of Jesus Christ they had received. And the very same grace and love that has changed and that had changed their own lives and compelled them to act with love towards one another. Now the tricky thing is, we don't actually know how Philemon responded. Uh, yeah, I'd like to think that he did what Paul asked him to do, but honestly, I don't know. Uh, and we don't know. Uh, but while we don't know how Philemon and only signs the story ends, Paul's words from 2,000 years ago apply directly to us today. He set this big picture out of what a Christian life looks like. It's got faith in Christ and love for the saints. Um, and in my mind, there are really four ways we can apply this text today. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you aren't a believer. You know you aren't in the family of God. You know you haven't received Jesus as Lord and Savior. You still carry around your sin and guilt with you. And you know your heart hasn't been changed to love others sacrificially. Would you look to Christ today and say, I believe? He offers the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness of your sins, and the hope of eternal life. Would you believe that Christ lived a perfect life, died the death on the cross that you deserve because of your sins, and was raised again from the dead on the third day as the promise of the resurrection of life for all who would believe in him? He offers that to you today. So do not waste another minute. Believe in him who died for you. And next, this really simple idea, for those who are part of the family of God, rejoice. You have this promise of salvation. You have this new heart that he's given you, and he has enabled you to serve others sacrificially. Would you rejoice in that idea? What an unbelievable turn of events. We have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he's made us new in Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit. Would you rejoice in that truth today? And thirdly, look for ways to serve one another. In this church, there are needs. In this church, there are ways that, that you all can serve one another. Who would benefit from a quick prayer, a good home-cooked meal, a time of fellowship, uh, a time where you just get to weep with one another? You get to rejoice with one another. How might you be Christ's hands and feet extended to the people in this room who need it? And lastly, looking beyond the four walls of this church, and I'm not speaking here specifically about mission dignity, there are brothers and sisters who are in need of the family of God. You heard a couple of them on the screen, but we that those were just five or six of the people that we serve. Annually, we serve about 2,500 people. Uh, and about 150 of them live here in the state of Georgia. Uh, I told you about Miss Dolly Holton, uh, who used to live in Lakeland. Her letter is a picture of the reminder of God's love and care for her that she receives and we're able to help provide for those basic needs. And I told you the story of Muriel Evans, who really is able to do what she does because of the help that we offer her uh, because of churches like you. But I'd like to end with one more story. Um, Leonard and Betty Gush, uh, Betty is still with us, but Leonard passed away a few years ago. Uh, 
but before they passed away, Leonard and Betty were in the ministry uh, for 26 years. And after Leonard retired, they found themselves struggling to make ends meet. And this is really the story of all 2,500 of the people that we serve. Expenses were increasing as their health went downward. And in 2013, they were approved for a financial grant from Mission Big Blue. And they wrote three letters to us over the course uh, of the year since then. And I'd just like to read some selections of those letters for you. Uh, in 2015, uh, we, we do a thing every year where we send out a Christmas check, just an extra blessing to our recipients. Uh, and it ranges anywhere from $250 to $400 for all 2,500 of those recipients. And in 2015, we sent them a check for Christmas, like we do for all of our recipients. And Betty wrote to us after that and said, I'm writing, to you, or I'm writing this with a very grateful heart. And your gift of $250 showed up in our bank account, and I just sat and praised God for it. Then your letter arrived yesterday, and my husband opened the mail, and I found him crying. And he said, someone cares. And he has dementia, and I've, been to and I've told him about the gift. Uh, but seeing the letter helped him register with him. I hope his words will let you know how thankful we are. And the ministry you provide is so very important. And the next year, we did the same thing. We sent him another Christmas check. Uh, and Gush just sent us another letter. This time written by Leonard. He said, my wife and I wish to thank the kind individuals and the churches who provided the gift of $250 to us at this time of year. It's with much joy to realize that we are part of this wonderful family of God's people. We are limited in being able to share much of Christmas, but this enables us to live beyond ourselves and do something for someone else. That has always been a big part of our lives, and we praise God for this gift. Also, let me express our heartfelt thanks and gratitude for the continued monthly support for mission dignity, as stated in the letter dated November 29, 2016. Leonard was always very meticulous. Uh, Truly, God is supplying our needs through you. And we periodically get notes of encouragement from your staff. And they always seem to come when we need a lift. We are always amazed at your thoughtfulness and how God uses you to bless others. And like I said, after a battle with dementia, Leonard passed away uh, last year in June. Betty called to let us know, and we were able to help her pay for the cost of Leonard's funeral. Uh, and soon after he passed, Ms. Betty's water heater stopped working. Uh, it's coming up on winter, so she needed a new water heater. We were able to provide the funds to get her that new water heater, get it installed, and take care of all of it. And a few weeks later, we got a letter from her that said the following. Dear loving and caring people, I'm overflowing with gratitude for the generous check to pay for my water heater. You have carried me when my feet could hardly move. I'm so thankful for Guidestone and Mission Dignity and for a loving God who touches the hearts of his people. Mission Dignity continues to serve Betty and hundreds more like her. And we're only able to do that because of churches like you. We don't receive cooperative program funding, so we're only able to send out monthly grants because of the generosity of God's people that are found in churches like Damascus. 100% of those donations, every cent that you give, goes to recipients uh, like Betty, like Miriam, like Molly. These people of God need you. Uh, within this room and outside of those four walls in the Mission Dignity Department, be the hands and feet of Christ to your brothers and sisters. And so the invitation is clear today. Brother Stockton will be up here uh, during the invitation time. To, it's twofold today. If you're not in the family of God, today is the day to join this family by believing in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you are in the family of God, today is the day to live actively in the Christian faith. Live out your faith by refreshing the saints today, both in this church and outside these four walls, and be a witness to a watching world desperately in need of a faith that produces a new heart, new actions, and gives them a new faith. As we open up the invitation, I'll end with Paul's words in verse 20 of Philemon. Uh, on behalf of the members of this church and our family in Christ outside these four walls. So as you look around, these are the words that our recipients are saying to you. These are the words that people who are hurting in here, who are rejoicing in here, want uh, to say to you. May we benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh our hearts in Christ.
invitation is hymn number 287, Take My Life, Lead Me, Lord. Would you stand, please? that so much. I'm going to ask Kyle to just stay with me here at the front and please, you know, come by and you know, tell him you're glad he was here and that he, that he presented the wonderful work of Mission Dignity, which is a part of Guidestone. So if you would, uh, let's, let's be dismissed. Okay. If you will say our benediction, Psalm 67 with me. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known upon the earth, your salvation among all nations. Amen.